This is a good stuff. All right, thank you, James, for that great introduction. Um, so today, I want to talk about a little bit about what Untapped is and how it can be a positive influencer on your life. People think beer is negative. I'm going to tell you it's positive. So let's get started. Okay, so first, who is this guy? That's me. It's a lovely picture. It's my backyard. That's not really important. Um, I'm the co-founder of Untapped. I'm also the CTO. I'm pretty much everything, because when you're in a two-man company, you can wear many hats. But CTO really sounds really fun, so I'm going to use it. Uh, I'm a New York City resident. Um, I specialize in PHP, JavaScript, and MySQL, which is a technology stack for Untapped. We also use a bunch of other technologies, but this talk is more around the data that we're generating, less about the technology we have. Um, my claim to fame, I'm not sure if this particular uh, TV show is here in the UK, but literally I was on Man vs. Food, which is an eating challenge on the Travel Channel for nine seconds about three years ago. It was awesome. My mom calls me and she was really ecstatic about it. It was fantastic. It still repeats sometimes late at night at two in the morning. So I'll get text messages from friends saying, I, I, I was really wasted, but I thought that was you for nine seconds. Are you sure? Yeah, it was me. So that, that's really fun. So uh, James gave a great introduction of what Untapped is. I'm just going to give a quick refresher. Like he said, we're a two-man bootstrap company. We do this part-time. Uh, I work for ABC News uh, back in the States, but I also do this on the side. Um, so what Untapped is, it's a basically a beer sharing application. So you check in your beers, you get recommendations. As you keep checking in more beers, you get recommendations based on your taste palette. So if you like IPAs or American Pale Ales, the app kind of knows what you like and recommends good beers. Um, we're all about being social, which is a great thing for, for beer, hence our name, Drink Socially, because beer is a very social activity, but it never was online in that kind of fashion. There are some forums like Beer Advocate and Rate Beer, but there were never really a social network where everyone could talk freely about the beer, rate it, and discover new ones. So that's kind of what we're all about, and here's some fancy screenshots that are kind of part of the course. So sharing is the, is the most important part of our application. We're finding that sharing happens on uh, around, I believe the last time we did some stats, was 10, 5 million shares per day on Untapped outside of social networks to Facebook, Foursquare, and Twitter. Um, and from those shares, people find out about new beers on Twitter, and then they're, they're engaged in that kind of process. So when you check in a beer on your, on your screen on the left, you have the option to rate it and then share it across the board. The, right, the left side is the web view that gets shown, and you can comment and toast, which is our form of a Facebook like. Um, that kind of gives people, hey, cheers, you know, thanks for trying our beer. So this is kind of what the interface looks like for the product. The most important part of this whole process is discovery. There are over millions and millions of beers across the world, and there's no way you can try every single one of them without dying. So what we're going to make you happy for you is we're going to tell you where you should go, what beers you should have, and where, where your friends are around you, so you can make your experience a lot better when it comes to drinking. So I had the pleasure of coming back here in, 2000 and, in last year, 2012, and we were still relatively new in, in the space. Uh, we just upgraded our app to another version. Um, we had around 121,000 users, around 4.3 million check-ins, and we just launched a photo feature of taking beer-related photos in our app, um, and we had 175,000. So here are some cool little stats on that. It has exploded in the last, in the last year. We were up to 400,000 users, or 21 million check-ins, and 2 million photos. Um, Amazon really likes us a lot because we're storing a lot of stuff with them. So I'm happy that I got a little discount today with my, my, my <laughs> talking today. So um, we're averaging around 3,000 check-ins per hour, 20,000 social shares per day, and uh, also 7.3 million reaches per day. So it's a very active community. As you can see, people love to drink beer. So that's a great thing. But this is great, right? But what can you tell us about the data that we're generating? Because I'm a data junkie, I'm not a, a PhD like Donnie or anything like that, but I, I love to see what, what decisions can happen based on what beers are being checked in on the service. So I pulled together some cool stats that I think will represent the drinking culture in London. But first, I want to talk about some of the problems that people have when they go to bars and how we're trying to accomplish with the app. This is taken from a great brewery out of California called Russian River. Now, if you're not familiar with this picture, if you've never seen it before, the first question you're going to ask yourself is, what the hell am I looking at? What beers are good on this list? I have no clue which one's good. A little, little trick, they're all really good. But that's besides the point. 
What we're trying to accomplish is giving you a frame of context when you go to a bar or a brewery. You're able to be able to open the app and find out what to have. That's the first thing we're trying to accomplish. Second is that we want to give exposure to the breweries that don't have the big reach like the big macro breweries all across the country. Back to the little arrow on the corner, that's a small brewery out of Ohio, but they don't really have the, the kind of marketing power to influence people to try their beer on national networks or in you know, uh, promotional materials. And lastly, location. Location is a huge requirement for many breweries. Sometimes you just can't expand or scale your business across multiple places in the US or in other countries. So knowing where the beer is sold is really important. But a lot of breweries don't have that kind of capability to say, hey, we sell to this bar and that over there, and we know they have it because they don't know that. They, dis they tell the distributor, and the distributor sells to the actual bar. So it provides some context. But really, it's all about the data that's being generated at the end. What does that tell us? So I, I pulled a list of the top check-in hours on Untapped in the London area in the last 30 days. And what I found really interesting is that most people drink around, I believe it's the 1900 hour or 7 p.m. But you guys don't stay out very late. Look at that drop right after there. So you're, you're spending a lot of time drinking in the 6 and 7 of the happy hour periods, but then you're dropping right off after that. And even after the uh, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock to 11, it's going down by almost 50%. So you can see that most of the time people are drinking around the happy hour period in London. This is different from the U.S. U.S. actually is, is actually the inverse of this, where it creeps up and it falls down around 3, 3 a.m. I'm not sure what that tells about our, our society, but that's what it is. So, Top drinking days in London. I thought Monday would be the least popular day to drink in London, but it actually is the fourth popular day in London. Uh, in the U.S., Monday becomes a very popular day as well, although I feel like many people are for forgetting to check in on the weekends and they'll just put it all on Monday, so they'll screw up our, our data analytics there. But I filtered all those out for this presentation, and I can tell you, Monday is a pretty big day in the UK, so that's what's surprising. Wednesday is the least day to drink in the UK. I would never have guessed that. I think Wednesday, hump day, you gotta get that over with, go to the bar after work, and, but not according to this data. So how about what to, what to, what to drink? This is a, a, a breakdown of the top f of six beers consumed in the UK in the last 30 days on Untapped. The only one I see there that uh, is, is worldwide is Guinness. I think Guinness has a special place in everyone's heart, especially on St. Patrick's Day or whatever, wherever it is. But you, know, you see a lot of different flavors of different beers there, which shows the type of community that you guys have here when it comes to beer. You're not ashamed to try something different. But how do we make decisions on what beer to drink? Do we ask our friends? Do we get insights from breweries that kind of push stuff? Does a bartender what, tell you what to drink? Is it by rating? This is a great stat I like to see. The left is the world and what they drink. The top, uh, top five checked in beers on the service. And one would say, if it's rated really high, you're gonna drink it. Everyone wants to drink the highest rated of beers. According to the world, that is not true whatsoever. It's 2.19 is the average rating out of five for Bud Light. It's the top checked in beer in the last 30 days on Untapped. So that's not true at all. But you guys are ahead of the curve. London, the top checked in beer is Guinness, which is a four rating, which is surprising, but look at the rest of the stuff. All microbreweries, with the exception of Fuller Smith and Carlsberg. You guys have one oddity right there. But everything's over three, so it really depends on where you're coming from and what your, your culture is like and what, what data is being driven by these particular check-ins. But I really think what, what drives the most amount of check-ins is social achievements. One thing we do have on our service is, is badges. So you do certain activities and you get badges for doing that. So drinking at a bowling alley or drinking at XYZ, you get an opportunity to have a digital achievement on your page. So we did a, a, a deal with Six Point, which is a brewery out of New York City, and we said we want to push your product called Brownstone. Brownstone is a, is a relatively small distributed product. It's a brown ale, it's very, very tasty. As you can see by the check-in chart on the left, it didn't have much traction until we launched the badge on uh, the 12th of uh, August last year. And they increased their check-ins by over 200% just by giving a user a digital badge or a digital achievement. So it's, it's really hard to understand the concept around that. The user is not getting anything. They're getting more drunk, which is great. They're drinking more beer, which is great. And they get a, a flashy little badge like on top left on their profile, and they're all ecstatic about it. And it drives sales. It's an interesting concept. 
So here are some of the badges we've done in the past. And really what I want to encompass here is that digital achievements are a great way for breweries or anyone to market something. I don't really understand the logic around it, but people love to uh, gain these badges, show off to their friends, and kind of brag about what they've got. They're not physical. You're not going to put them on your sleeve like you're in Boy Scouts. You're not going to print them out. It's the digital achievement people are all ecstatic about. Another point is communication. On Untap, we have a platform that allows breweries to communicate directly with consumers. I can't stress this enough on how important this is, that breweries allow themselves to be communicated to anyone who uses their, their drinks or beer. What we want to see as individuals, and we'll talk about this a little later, is how, who is behind the beer you're actually drinking. That really defines craft. You can't just have someone go out there and give you a beer and you don't even know who's behind it. That just drives connection between you and the brewer, which makes you a much more loyal customer. On our product, we've, over 2,500 breweries have already claimed their page on Untapped, which allows them to have this connection between the brewery and the customer, which is really important. So how do you scale as a brewery, keeping with the theme of the conference, while still being craft? It's a very common question that you can apply, not just to breweries, but also to technology companies or anything in the sense that you want to scale. The number one thing is passion. People want to see the passion that you're actually, you have with the product that you're building. So if you have a beer that you want to sell, people want to know who's behind that beer. If, you, if you're not promoting that beer or, or putting your blood, sweat, and tears in it, people will know. The quality will dip. And that's why mass-produced items, you don't really see the passion in it. As I mentioned, communication. Communication is very key. This is Camden Town Brewery here, and someone was asking, do you guys distribute to Australia? Now, a big ma ma macro brewery might not respond to this tweet or respond in general, but they did, and now this guy is keeping a lookout for their product. You want to create this kind of communication between the users and yourself. Scale growth. Now, this is from Beer Advocate, and a lot of people say, you know, uh, oh, I got to take over the world. I got to, I got to attribute to every single co country in the world to sell my product. You have to start small, and when you do sm start small, you can't have people like this guy who's a naysayer that says, you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm, uh, bothers me when they don't distribute when people want it. If you don't, if you, if you can't deal with the the distribution problems and the actual beer distribution issues, then don't go to every single market. F focus your attention on the ones you're good at and expand after you continue to, to refine your process. A very good uh, brewery like this is, new, uh, is a six point in actually New York, which has not expanded beyond New York until the last six months. They spent two years just distributing in New York alone until they figured out their system, understand their limits, and then expanded. A lot of breweries go out way too fast, and same thing with companies. If they expand too much, then it turns out that you're not going to be ready for that kind of the movement. So craft is not, just def is not just brewing a limited release beer. It really isn't. And most people, like major breweries, would think that, hey, if I take Bud Light and I basically put it out as a limited release and only put it into certain segments, is that considered a craft? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> craft is like building something you're passionate about and letting it show in your product. Anything you build, anything you make, this is the important factor, is that knowing the passion is behind what you build and letting the quality of the product live. So a lot of these microbreweries follow this to the T. They're building in small quantities. You can see the passion. You can see who's behind it. And that's what's really driving the interaction between you and that product. People love experiences that are tailored toward themselves. That's why people go to high-end coffee shops, you know, have the coffee we had here at the conference. You want that kind of experience. I think the key thing to re remember when you're building anything is that if the passion isn't there and the user can't see it, it's not going to be craft in a sense. So with that, I'm going I'm to end and say that you have to get, get ready to start drinking socially. And if you haven't downloaded the, the, app, the app on tap, please check it out. I'll be happy to be around and answer any questions. And thank you very much.